Okay, welcome everyone to the Judiciary Committee hearing this Tuesday, March 14th. This is our 930 agenda. If we have a, a catastrophic technical failure, we'll try again tomorrow at 10 a.m. in this room, Wednesday the 15th and 016. Uh, we do have a two minute time limit on testimony, both for Zoom testifiers and in person on the on the Zoom, you'll see a two minute countdown. And if, if you're in person, a, a little buzzer will go off at two minutes. Okay, first up today is HB 68. This appropriates funds to establish a centralized statewide criminal pretrial justice data reporting and collection system. Uh, first up on HB 68 is uh, Aaron Harbinson for the judiciary. Good morning. Good morning, Chair, committee members. Uh, my name is Erin Harbinson. I'm the director of the Criminal Justice Research Institute. Uh, thank you for hearing House Bill 68. It is an appropriation request to fund the pretrial database and reporting system, which we are required to establish under law. The system will help provide information, data, research to inform the, uh, the pretrial system and pretrial policy decision making. And we submit written testimony. Uh, we stand on those um, on that testimony. And if you have any additional questions, I'm here to answer them. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Next up is Philip Higdon, administrator for the Attorney General. Ah, oh, you're here. Good morning. Morning, morning Chair Rhodes. Committee. My name is Phil Higdon. I'm an administrator of the Hawaii Criminal Justice Data Center. The Department of the AG has submitted testimony in support of this bill. We understand the importance of a centralized statewide criminal pre pretrial justice data reporting and collection system still without funding the objectives of the criminal justice research institute will be limited in accomplishing their objectives thank you i'll be happy to answer any questions if you have great thank, thank you. you next up is Trisha Nakamatsu for the uh, prosecuting attorney city and county of honolulu and okay. support okay thank you next is martha tornay tornay for hawaii correctional Systems Oversight Commission. Uh, in support, Linda Rich for Women's Prison Project and support Opportunity Youth Action Hawaii. Also in support, Janet Davidson in support. That's everybody who's signed up for HB 68. Does anyone else wish to testify? Okay, well, hang on. Um, in the middle here in the blue shirt, come on up. And then um, Angela. Good morning. Hello, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Fambeo Velasco. I'm a current 1L student at the U.S. Miss Richardson School of Law. Can you just pull them up oh, physically closer to you? Yeah, no problem. Perfect. Thanks. And I'm also a policy uh, intern at the Opportunity Youth Action Hawaii, or also known as OYA. Um, so OYA is an umbrella of organizations and individuals that seek to reduce incarceration for Opportunity Youth, and Opportunity Youth are seen as those who are young people under the age of 25 who are disconnected from both work and school. So we see the creation of a centralized uh, statewide criminal pretrial database and collection system as an opportunity to streamline data collection, saving time and resources for agencies, as well as encouraging the generation of uh, substantive research. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Ms. Kim, did you want to come up? Angela? Good morning. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, and the Judiciary Committee. Angela Melody Young testifying on behalf of CARES. Um, so I'm going to read from a framework for pretrial justice. Um, essential elements of an effective pretrial system and agency from the National Institute of Corrections is a document which supports evidence-based practices that improve decision-making at the pretrial stage of our criminal justice system. And it enhances the safety of a, um, our communities while fostering the fair administration of pretrial um, pre-trial stages and detention. So this publication presents and describes these um, elements as well as the components of an evidence-based framework for improving pretrial outcomes nationwide. And one of the things that it talks about is bail determination. Um, it is a um, one of the most vital decisions in criminal justice and courts that make evidence-based decisions um, set these goals. Um, one, protecting community safety, two, ensuring a defendant's return to court, and three, um, implementing detention decisions on an individual defendant's risk and the community's norms for liberty, um, while providing judicial officers with clear legal options for appropriate pretrial and, and detention decisions. Um, so a judge determines the amount of bail 
based on factors like the severity of the alleged offense, the likelihood that the defendant will commit another crime, and the chances that the defendant will flee the jurisdiction before trial. Um, so these are all factors to consider during the pre-trial stage um, of the criminal justice um, system. So um, integrating all the data is very crucial to help judges make the right decisions and so that the people who offend can either get appropriate treatment or um, maybe something more of a severe consequence. Um, and, you know, last week during a city budget meeting, um, we heard from the prosecuting's attorney. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Would anyone else like to testify on HB 68? HB 68. If not, members, questions? Uh, uh, Dr. Harbinson, can you come back up? So why has it taken three, why has it taken three years since staff were hired to request funding for a data reporting and collection system? Was, was there some other, were other options explored unsuccessfully or? Sure, uh, Chair. Um, uh, so again, Aaron Harbinson, uh, Criminal Justice Research Institute. Uh, so, Act, yeah, Act 179 passed in 2019. Um, it, there was a little bit of a delay by the time board members got appointed. There's a board of directors. Uh, and then I was the first staff hire and I started in November, 2020. So it's been a little over two years. Uh, when I first arrived, uh, the you know new, new organization, new work here, uh, the first step was really understanding the criminal justice or the pretrial policies, the operations, the practices, the data landscape, what IT systems are where, what data they collect, the quality of that data, and understanding that framework. Uh, we also, uh, along, along with that, looked at whether other states have done. There's a lot of movement across the country to centralize uh, information into these data systems, whether for pretrial or sentencing. So we wanted to ensure we talked to other places that had started this work to learn from them, uh, what were some of the pros and cons. Uh, typically, agencies um, will pick a database from a software company and you still have to make some different upgrades to it to make it work for your system and they're pretty expensive undertakings. And so we did want to make sure that we looked at different options to find something that would fit Hawaii and Hawaii data, something that would reduce the, the workload on agencies, knowing that this, the data that we collect is really about the operations and, and people in the field entering information to do their jobs. So we didn't want to add additional workload or silo more data. So really explore these different options okay. to come so, up with this. So it took three years? Um, about 20, two years. Two years. But you yeah. started in 2020, mm -hmm. 21, 22, 23. Mm -hmm. Two, two and a half years, yeah, a little over or close to three years, yes. Um, so what's the timeline to have the operational data system and have the data system operational? Um, so in terms of being able to report out metrics and, and, yes. and all of that. So with the last fall, I should say we also did a feasibility study. I didn't mention that. Uh, that's also really important. So we worked with a vendor to map out what the system could look like. It is individualized to the local data system. So to map out a realistic timeline and cost estimates. And we have about a two year total estimate in terms of developing the whole system. But the plan is to integrate data kind of on a rolling basis. So there are some metrics we could start reporting out earlier on. Uh, and then other metrics which have, uh, are just more difficult to compile that information and clean it up for data analysis, those might come later in the process. So we know that this information is really important to people and we don't want to delay it. We really don't want to delay it. Um, so we'll, we'll do, we'll find ways to balance what is, what is data that's clean that we can report on earlier on in the process. Uh, and then also if there are, certain priorities of information that people need to have immediately if there's ways we can kind of triage or stage that in a way to, to get information out sooner rather than later. Okay. Uh, the vast majority of the requests of 2.3 million is for an IT consultant. Were, were there any internal options within the, within the judiciary explore? Um, or was this always going to be an, an external uh, contract? 
So to develop the system itself, um, we, we did have to rely on a contractor. There's no one internally that has um, either the resources or the uh, expertise to do this, uh, this specific part of the work because we are basically working across the three agencies. So that's the other layer too, is that it's not just judiciary data, it's Department of Public Safety and is arrest data from the Criminal Justice Data Center. And so there's different operating systems, different data systems. And so um, having a contractor who specializes in this work to build it out, to uh, build those IT pathways would uh, be the most, uh, the best way to do that and really the only way. So that leads me to my next question. So mm -hmm. since some of the information is coming from an executive branch agency, is the is the, office, the state's Office of Enterprise Services gonna be able to help or have you asked them for help? Um, so at this time, we haven't worked directly with them. We've been working through uh, the, the Department of Public Safety and the Criminal Justice Data Center through their IT staff, their legal staff, policy staff, operations staff to present the project, get feedback, uh, to ensure that we're following rules and, and accommodating all the policies there. And we also have- yeah, You have been in touch with the executive branch and on the IT level to see whether they can offer any help in terms of minimizing the external contract? Uh, not at the state level. Um, my understanding is because we're attached to the judiciary and going through that uh, procurement process, we follow the state procurement process um, through through the judiciary. Um, so we're extracting data into the system um, and setting up uh, MOUs and agreements through that to cover the data from the executive branch. Okay, but the executive, I mean, we're still all the same government, so there's no reason not to ask the executive branch for assistance if we can get it from them, right? Uh, sure, if, if I can, yeah, check with them to see if there's any um, uh, anything else to look into. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what are the security and confidentiality issues with the interagency sharing of data? Is that, are you, I'm assuming you're taking that into consideration and that you're not planning to share anything that you're not supposed to share outside the group that's doing the, the doing the sharing, I guess. Sure. Uh, so because the data is coming together for research purposes, uh, that is part of why we're establishing MOUs to ensure that we follow the confidentiality and privacy rules of the different data from the different agencies. Um, there's lots of different rules depending on the agency and the specific data you're pulling from. And we are at this point extracting information in a de-identified way so that um, when information is pulled together, no one can really go in, even when we pull down data sets, it's difficult to figure out who a specific person is. We're using identifiers to link records. So we are setting up the system to really limit the information that um, would make it difficult to identify people. And then the information is being aggregated for statistics, for metrics, for evaluation, for reporting. So we would not be reporting any identifiable uh, private confidential so, records or anything like that. You, would you object if we put in into statute that you're supposed to keep the, the data um, secure? Uh, I can confirm with our judiciary, you know, data privacy you know, policies. I don't want to speak for, for them, but I don't see why. I don't see any problem or any concern doing that. Okay. Um, that's pretty much what we have in our MOUs as much as we can secure and keep okay. the data information private. Yeah. So a very specific question. So will the database include info on people who make bail? So there's a lot of emphasis on people are, you know, uh, releasing their own cognizance who uh, you know, we want to know whether they show up to court and all that kind of stuff. But for people who actually make bail, are you going to be tracking that kind of information too? Yes. So we are, when we spent the time doing the data mapping, um, it did take some time because of the amount of information that Act 179, there are metrics that we have to report out uh, under Chapter 614, a range of pretrial metrics. And we wanted to figure out what data systems would give us that information. So we identified the three data systems that house most of the pretrial information. The biggest barrier in all of this is being able to 
uh, transform that information into data. And bail is one of the more difficult ones to transform into metrics, but uh, we will be reporting out onto it uh, eventually just because we know it's part of Act 179. We know it's important to pretrial and that, um, you know, understanding how people are released also um, helps the Oversight Commission uh, and, and others with information on what happens when people are released and, and what their outcomes are. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Members, other questions? Yes. Senator Sam Go ahead. So, um, are there any other states that do, does this kind of data tracking? Uh, yes. Uh, so, pretrial specifically. Uh, so, that was some of the work that we did was talk to other states doing this. So, Illinois, um, they they started a pretrial data scoping. I would say uh, even before 2019. I want to say kind of started internally in 2017, um, and we talked to them to learn a little bit about what they're doing for their data practices. Uh, so any other state other than Illinois? Uh, yes. Um, so let's see. Sorry, I'm on the spot. There's some counties. There are different counties that are doing this work. There's the. So um, when you talk to Illinois, did you talk to them about their software, who their vendor is, whether or not they have any data breaches, that kind of thing? Yes. Uh, in fact, it was uh, through all of our discussions, it was talking to Illinois about the challenges they face with data and data software and vending that that actually led us to the route that what we went on. We were able to go with um, one of the same vendors for some of the software. Okay. So the, basically, safe. that's what I want to know was oh. whether or not the cost estimate you came up with mm -hmm. is based upon a vendor who had already provided similar software to another state. Oh, sure. Yeah. So the during the feasibility study, we went through this, we found the vendor is actually through state procurement. So we went through that process. We didn't have to do an RFP. Um, and they are a vendor that has worked with another state collecting pretrial data to and, centralize and no it. data breaches, right? Uh, not to my knowledge. I haven't heard of anything yet. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Thank you, Dr. Harbinson. Um, Mr. Administrator Higdon, can I have you back up? So a similar question to what I asked Dr. Harbinson about the, uh, you know, the the the, um, the external contract compared to what you might be able to do in house. Do you have any comments on that? Is this something that we can't could do in house conceivably? I mean, you're you're the executive branch, so I realize it's not. Oh, it's not completely your baby, but right. Any, uh, any any help that the executive branch could offer? I can't speak for ETS. I can only speak for the data center. Um, we have limited resources at this point, at this time, uh, staffing wise. I think if we were fully staffed, I think that there would be a possibility to help. Uh, we're helping as much as we can now, but as uh, creating something like they're wanting to create is probably well outside of what we were able to do at this time, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Other questions, members? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We'll go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is HB 126. This increases the penalty for bribery offenses under certain circumstances. First up on HB 126 is David Van Acker or the Attorney General. Oh, you're here. Looking at the Zoom screen. Good morning. Hi, good morning. <clears throat> good morning, Chair members. Uh, my name is Chuck Fu Louis. I'm a Deputy Attorney General and I'm standing in for David Van Acker. Uh, the department is in support of this bill. However, we do note that the phrase notwithstanding any law to the contrary in subsection five of the bill and in the existing statute is uh, unnecessary and should be stricken. And in, and in addition, apologize for not putting it in written testimony, but in the same subsection is currently reads that a person convicted of violating this section shall not be eligible for deferral. Um, technically, the purpose of a deferral is to avoid a conviction. So we recommend changing the wording to a person charged under this section shall not be eligible. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next up is Gary Cam, uh, Campaign Spending Commission, or, or his designee. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chair, uh, Vice Chair members. Um, Campaign Spending Commission supports this bill. Um, we uh, support, of course, the enhancement of criminal penalties um, for offenses involving public correct corruption. And if enforced, we believe that criminal penalties are the most effective remedies to deter public corruption. So I'm available for questions, but thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Next up is Trisha Nakamatsu for the City and County's uh, Prosecutor's Office. Good morning. Morning, Chair. 
uh, members of the committee, Deputy Prosecutor Trisha Nakamatsu, appearing on behalf of Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney's Department. This bill is part of our department's legislative package. We thank you for hearing it, Chair. We're in strong support. We feel that the heightened level of severity for um, public servants who are in heightened levels of, of power um, should be held to a higher standard. Uh, we feel that the Class A felony would be appropriate, as well as these other instances in which either the amount in question for the bribery was um, over $20,000, which is comparable to first degree theft. And then if it was involved in three or more acts in a three year period, um, we would concur. And that was a, it's a good catch by the AGs as far as a person convicted of violating the session. Technically, if they're gonna get a deferral, then they're not convicted. So charge would be an appropriate word. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is the Maui Prosecutor's Office in support, Andrew Crossland in support, Dar Carlin in support, Lynn Madison in support. That's all, that's everybody who signed up on HB 126. Does anyone else wish to testify on HB 126? Okay, seeing on members questions? Uh, yes, I do. Senator Sam Bonaventura. Uh, Trisha Nakamatsu, come on up. So since it's part of your package, is there a, um, Lesser included offense if we bump up the class B to a class A. Uh, if the entire statute was bumped up to a class A. Well, the, that's what the that's what your bill is, right? It bumps it up to a class A, which was an existing class B. Uh, yeah, well, if we weren't able to meet the standards for the class A felony, we could still rely on the regular bribery charge if that's applicable. And what and what? B. If, which is a class yeah for B. all public servants. It's a, charge of bribery the class B. And also those who are um, conferring or offering. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I have, oh, I'm sorry, other mem questions for other members? Okay, uh, can I have uh, the Attorney General back up again? So I just wanna be sure I got the, uh, yeah, I, th I think I agree with you on the, uh, the charging versus conviction. So that, where was that again exactly? So that will be on the bill, page two, line 18. Okay. Subsection five, a person charged under this section instead of convicted of violating. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, members on HB 126? Being none, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next bill. Uh, HB 132, this establishes definitions for purposes of electronic voting, specifies additional requirements and procedures with which this chief election officer must comply when using an electronic voting system. Uh, first up on 132 is Scott Nago for the, uh, the chief elections officer. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, the Office of Elections stands on its written testimony and support and will be available to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Felicia Cowden. County of Kauai council member in opposition, Mel Raposo County of Kauai council member also in opposition, Jamie Detweiler for Hawaii Federation of Republican Women. Good morning. Aloha, good morning chair and members of the committee. Jamie Detweiler, president of the Hawaii Federation of Republican Women. I stand on my written testimony with one correction in the text that's in item number three um, in the middle of the par paragraph where it says as of February 1 that should be corrected to as of March 13 today 2023. So the Federation stands in op strong opposition of HB 132 um, and I'd like to just highlight a couple of points in my Point number two with regards to electronic voting requirements currently in HRS 16-42. So that's our current law. Uh, HB 132 proposes to remove hand counting of paper ballots in audits. It proposes also to remove the random selection of 10% of the precincts to be audited, as well as remove the need to count all races on a ballot. It will allow the use of ballot images to conduct the audit instead of original paper ballots. Ballot images have been compromised as evidenced by numerous forensic audits nationwide. So I wanted to make that um, emphasis. Moving on to point number three, 
Uh, there's been maladministration here with our own state office of elections with regards to non-compliance of the current law, HRS 16-42. On November 14th, I submitted a certified letter as well as in person to the Office of Elections requesting an audit under HRS 16-42. On December 12th, I testified before Election Commission regarding this matter. And as of today, I have not received a response. I do have the certified receipt copy of their receipt of my request to conduct the audit. And to this day, I have not received any contact via mail, Thank email, you. or phone. Thank you very much. Next Thank up you. Is Please do not pass this bill. Thank Thanks. you for Thank this you. opportunity. Next up is Bonnie Marsh uh, for Upcountry Doctor in opposition, Lozana Loma for For Our Rights in opposition, Celine McCormick for West Hawaii GOP in opposition, Austin Shiloh Martin, Libertarian Party. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I suppose we're going with this. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, I want to stand on my written testimony and add a few comments um, with great respect to the meaningful, uh, difficult work this body does on our behalf and representing the people and must respectfully urge each of you to vote against HB 132. This is a dangerous bill. It directly violates the Democrat Party platform on page 57 from 2020, where it says, we must give voters the confidence that their ballot was counted as cast by supporting mandatory statistically meaningful post-election audits and full transparency of all election results and data. This bill does the opposite. It forever places into private companies uh, the security of our election. Um, our vendors would have full control and there would be no way to get this back without radical action from this body. Worse, this legislation appears to be an attempt to um, change the laws that the Office of Elections and the Attorney Generals were caught breaking this, this last election cycle as a matter of record. And when questioned about the extent of their immunity, um, they believed that they were fully immune from any possible claim that could ever be brought against them, including widespread racial disparity, um, which this, this was a conversation that took place in J Judge Jill Otake's court in federal court. Um, I was frankly stunned by this. And I'm extremely concerned to see this legislation here. Not only does it violate all of our shared common um, uh, values that, that we should be upholding, it, it, actually, it actually destroys any chance that we ever will have of having real confidence in the results or the accuracy. I urge you all to, to vote no on this, to kill this bill now. And more than that, an investigation should be commit, commenced on the origins of this bill. Um, I think that's actually really important. The attorney generals and the Office of Elections should not be trying to change the election laws that they were previously caught breaking. They should be striving to be in compliance with this body, not delivering slaps in the face to the people and to all of you good representatives who are here doing this difficult work. Thank, Thank you, you for hearing me today. Aloha. Next up is Rosemary, I'm uh, sorry to butcher your name, Jouch or Jouch for KRP Elections Integrity Team. Uh, in opposition. Next is Jake Hoffman for Voter Trust on Zoom. There you are. Good morning. How's it going? Can you? I can hear you. Hey, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I, I, I'm going to amend the statement that I that I submitted. Um, I'm just going to speak to you guys real quick. I'm the executive director of a uh, of an organization called Voter Trust. I've also worked on um, legislation here in Florida to revise elections uh, and some of the uh, in 2021. Uh, most jurisdictions in the United States use paper voting because it is proven to be secure, voter verifiable, and 100% transparent. That's a direct quote from Hart InterCivic. Heart, uh, Hawaii's choice for voting machines. They said that two weeks ago and then released a video on their process. So when it comes to election reform, critics often say something along the lines of why well, fix something when it isn't broken? Well, if a paper ballot is secure, verifiable, 100% transparent method of voting, why would you change that? And in 2020, the solar wind cyber attack on federal agencies, uh, which was attributed to Russian hacking group led by the worst led to the worst cyber espionage events in American history was still only two years ago. It affected the U.S. Treasury, the Department of Commerce, NATO, the European Parliament, the DOD, the National Nuclear Security Administration, and many others. 
And I bring this up only because it would be naive and negligent for a governing body to turn a blind eye to the very real possibility of cyber espionage on the most precious institution we have, which is voting, even if it's not been a problem in the past. But having a paper copy of your citizens' votes is the ultimate failsafe in the event of a catastrophic cyber event. Additionally, with the introduction of ranked choice voting in your state, the complicated nature of counting in these type of elections makes auditing by hand impossible and relies entirely on an AI algorithm to attribute vote counts. As the founder of a digital media company, I'm very pro-tech, and I don't want you to mistake this as an indictment on voting machines, but why on earth would we leave our election counts in the hands of an algorithm that you or I couldn't possibly verify? Uh, did you know that the Heritage Foundation also ranks Hawaii 51st in the United States for election security? That's because they, they also include Washington, D.C. My organization has a long list of suggestions to make the state's elections more secure, but this bill somehow makes them less secure than they already are. And if thank you're going to cast your bill on, your vote on this bill, oh, thank you. Next is Scott Shedko uh, in opposition. Uh, Kalei Kiley Keeney. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Shedko. Yes. Oh, come on. I'm sorry. I didn't see you there. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Honorable Chair Rhodes and uh, committee members, I'm here in opposition of uh, HB 132. Uh, I'd like to read just the first uh, five lines of page three. Voter or uh, paper audit trail uh, may be used to assess the accuracy of the voting machine's electronic record and to verify the election results. Uh, I think that's what we all want. However, on page five, beginning on line five, it says the audit may be conducted with scanned images of the ballots. Uh, beginning on line nine, it says technology may be used in lieu of the physical paper ballots. And uh, there's really no need to scan ballots and then count the scanned images. This would allow for one more level of complexity and opportunity for the image to be either intentionally or unintentionally altered. We should have an audit that is completely separate from the electronic voting system. I would be much more encouraged as far as our election security if line five read the audit may not be conducted with scanned images of the ballots. Line nine red technology may not be used in lieu of the physical paper ballots. Ballot images can be altered. Why we'd like to think it doesn't happen. We should not be trusting the results of the machines just because the people who provide them to us say to trust us. There's hundreds of experts who can attest how easily Voting machines, computers in general can be uh, can fail or be hacked. I would just like in conclusion to refer to a man named Clinton Curtis, who wrote uh, one of the first codes to uh, determine the outcome of an election. He has about 30 videos okay. and would Thank let you understand why we're so concerned. Thank you Thank for you your much. time and attention. Next is colleague Kylie Keeney on Zoom. All right, Chair, they're currently not on Zoom. Okay, in opposition, Adriel, uh, Adriel Lamb. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, committee members. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify. I uh, have my written testimony. I'd like to uh, highlight some of that testimony with an example of what you're asking us to believe with this legislation. Um, this, as the other test, as the test witnesses have testified in court, that um, this has gone to court. Uh, they've, the office of election has been shown to have been in violation of the law, and they're now trying to rewrite the law. So I do have here um, 10 bags of M&Ms for you to look at and tell me how many, um, what, how many M&Ms of what type and colors are there. But you're telling me to believe that I can take this technology here and scan for the colors of the m ms in here and that the report is 173 m ms with 
93 greens, 33 blue, 10 yellows, eight reds, five browns, and 24 oranges. And that's all you need to know because this is secure, this is proprietary, and this is the results that you want me to believe. And I can submit this for the record if you want to show you that this is what you want me to believe is in these bags. Thank you for your opportunity to testify. Yeah, I'm up for any questions that you may have. Great, thank you very much. Next is Corinne Solomon. Oh, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, honorable chair and committee members. I stand with my written opposition in, um, in I stand with my written testimony in opposition of House Bill 132. There are three nonpartisan national organizations that have developed post-election audit best practices guidelines. The U.S. Election Assistance Commission, the Brennan Center for Justice, and the National Association of Secretaries of State, of which Sylvia Luke is a member. HB 132 goes against the guidelines set forth by all of these organizations. In the interest of time, I would just like to highlight a couple excerpts from some of these guidelines. In the EAC 2020 post-election audits, it reads, ballot image audits have raised concerns among some election integrity and security experts because the review is only of digital images and not of the official paper record. Traditional post-election audits are usually conducted by hand tallying a sample of paper records and comparing the results to election reports produced by voting systems. Although automated audits can reduce costs and improve the efficiency of post-election audits, there are important factors election officials consider when using this audit method. Using the same equipment to retabulate ballots may not reveal programming or tabulation errors in the voting system. I do believe that HB 132 was written in response to the malfeasance or perhaps sloppiness or laziness, I'm not really sure, that was done by the Office of Elections when they did not conduct the post-election audits in 2020 or 2022 in accordance with our law. And I strongly believe that our laws should be written to reflect what is the best practices for our audits, not to be written to correct prior law breaking. And I appreciate this opportunity to testify. I strongly urge you to oppose this bill. This is not going to uh, develop any, any integrity or trust in our elections, and it does just quite the opposite. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Brent Colbus. There you are. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. Mahalo for allowing me to testify. My name is Brett Colbus. I'm a 26-year Navy veteran and was a 2022 official election observer. I'm also chair of the Honolulu County Republican Party, but I'm representing myself because this is not a partisan issue. I oppose HD 132, specifically the changes to 1642B3. I don't believe it's unreasonable to ask that audits are conducted using paper ballots as opposed to scanned images. As an observer, I observed discounted votes because the electronic tally system did not accept ballots with what is called resting pen marks or ballots where the boxes were not completely filled in and ballots that had other stray marks in the ballot scanning area. This caused the electronic system to consider those votes as either over votes or under votes. If the paper ballots were the source of the audit, it would have been obvious how the voter voted and those votes would have been counted by the auditors. In the primary, I had asked about why the ballots were not being sorted into precincts because I knew this was how, or at least I assumed this was how they were going to be counted. Uh, and I was told that after the 2020 election, it was just too difficult to do that. Changing the use of ballots from, changing the use of paper ballots from mandatory to optional in the audits, you know, it's just human nature to take the easiest path. And in my experience, unfortunately, government workers will always take the easiest option. Voter confidence is at an all time low. And I attribute that to the pandemic. The use of the paper ballots for audits will go a long way to regain voter confidence. Mahalo for this opportunity. Thank you. Next up is Thomas Stanton. Good morning. Good morning. Uh... Mahalo to you all for this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Tom Stanton. I'm the Kauai Republican Party uh, Election Integrity Chair for Kauai. And I am intimately familiar with this because 
the efforts on Kauai and the rest of the islands, uh, I believe, have driven uh, this bill. Um, make no mistake, the purpose of this bill is to eliminate the currently required paper ballot audits of our election machines. Uh, it also seeks to change our voters' paper ballot uh, as the definitive record of a vote cast, and it quite possibly will lead to the elimination of any audit entirely. And the reason I know this is because the verbiage in this bill comes directly from the rebuttal that Scott Nago and Rick Nakamura uh, used, the argument they used uh, against the complaint to get the uh, Office of Elections to do the audits for the law. H.R. 1642 was put in place by some very principled ethical politicians who realized that when we went to mail-in voting, all mail-in voting and all machines, excuse me, all voting was conducted by machine, we needed to have some sort of check on that machine. So they developed HRS 1642. If a machine were currently to malfunction after the first 200 ballots are put through that machine, the only way to determine if the election results are accurate is with the 1642 audit. If we don't have that audit, we have no ability to know if the results are accurate. And it, it is absolutely essential for that reason. So thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you. That's everyone who has signed up to be here in person or on Zoom. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Uh, Jessica Cayazo, is that you? Just, hang on just a second. Uh, Jessica Cayazo, are you here? Okay, she's in opposition as well. Okay, come on up. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Good. Thank you for hearing my testimony about this bill. Um, I strongly oppose HB 132. I believe that it's in the state's best interest for uh, all voters that uh, paper ballots are used for audits. Um, I believe that there is a discrepancy um, in how we are uh, going forward with not only transparency and accountability, but also how we represent the citizens of the state of Hawaii. There's been um, lawsuits filed against the Office of Elections. Uh, and there are, that are currently still active. There are people who are asking for cast vote records that um, have yet to been, be produced. And I think that um, in the interest of the state and um, providing uh, peace of mind to everyone involved, whether you're what, whatever side of the aisle you're on, the, um, the best thing to do would to vote no on this bill and allow for due process to go forward so that we all know that we can um, feel safe in our election um, in our election processes in the state. You know, I, um, I, I'm a little nervous, but okay. I just also want to state that um, Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Luke is part of the National Association of Secretary of State NASS. And um, HB 132 goes against all the best practices by that organization. So I think that um, I would really appreciate if all the members here would just vote no today and allow for due process to be uh, observed. And that's it. Thank you so much. All right. Much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify on HB 132? Okay. Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Cynthia Bartlett. Um, I sent in written testimony. I, want, I wanted to tell you a more personal story. I have four people in my household, and I worked very hard to get them uh, to sign up to be voters in the past election. What happened was um, one, of, one of the people who signed up as a new voter received two ballots about three weeks apart. Um, that led them to um, not vote. Um, they lost, you know, they lost uh, belief in the system. 
the uh, the second person in my household uh, voted with me in person at Honolulu Hale and uh, put it in the machine and everything. And in January, I received a letter that her vote did not was not counted. She's never going to vote again in Hawaii. So a lot of people need the paper ballots to keep up their trust. I think it's very important. Um, I was an election observer myself. I come from New York City, and I like to be a little bit of an observer and a Nancy Drew. And I befriended the elder uh, senior man that worked in in, in the city and county for many, many years. And he actually chose me to help seal the wax seals on each machine. And um, I was just asking him about, you know, what could go wrong with these machines? And I said, well, couldn't somebody just get another set of these seals and come in here at night and reseal them? And he said, sure, they could just order another set. And that was just me as a lay person. Um, also, they're not tied to the internet, but they have to pull out a little hard drive and walk them across the room, um, that's, that's another area where things could be interfered with. So he told me five or six of those things um, uh, and felt that, um, you know, paper ballots should be a good backup. The last thing he said that a lot of signatures Thank don't match much. if you use a middle name. Anyone else wishing to testify on HB okay. 132? Anyone else wishing to testify on HB 132 on Zoom or here? Okay, so uh, let me just give everybody the counts. There was a, a lot of other testimony, almost all of it was in opposition. Two in support, 118 opposed, and one comment. Uh, members, questions? Uh, let's see, where should I start? Uh, can we go back to uh, Jamie Detweiler for the Federation of America, the Republican women? So you, you made reference to some sort of uh, malfeasance. Were there court cases? Did somebody actually file a formal complaint? What, what's the, okay, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll slow down. <laughs> you made reference to malfeasance. What were you referring to? Yes, the um, non-response to my certified letter. Okay, sorry. so there was, no, there was no court case? There is a court case that was filed by someone else, um, a resident on Kauai, Ralph Kushney. That case went all the way to the Hawaii Supreme Court. And what was the result? Yeah, it was a long case. Um, I, I don't want to do it injustice by summarizing the work that, that he did, but in essence, um, it, it was declined. Okay. It was so declined by the court. The complaint, the complaint was rejected by the Supreme Court. Right, it, it did make its way through. Um, there were motions from both sides. Um, uh, right. uh, but it would so be good for you to refer, review that, really, because some really good things came out of it, and also statements from the judge in that case. So with regard to the paper ballots, I mean, uh, Hawaii has been criticized for going all mail vote, and a lot of, I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of Republicans are opposed to all mail voting, but that, Almost everybody in Hawaii leaves a paper trail because that's that's what they vote on is a piece of paper. Correct. So we have a paper trail. But HB 132 wants to only do audits based on the images, the computer images. So that will so eliminate the paper you're, ballot. You're concerned that but, I mean, it doesn't eliminate the paper ballot. It still exists. The paper ballot exists, but it would not be used in audits. It would not be required according to HB 132. Okay, it can, it, it can be used, but it, it doesn't, you're right, it doesn't, it's not required. Okay. Correct. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Nago, are you still here? Yes. So, um, so I guess my question is, so are there, are there any outstanding lawsuits or complaints right now from this last election? not regarding um, this whole paper audit process. All those court cases have been resolved. And, and were they all resolved in the, in the Office of Elections favor? They, they've been dismissed, yes. Okay, all of them. How many were there, do you know? There were two followed, filed as contest for cause in the primary and the general that went to the Supreme Court that was dismissed. And there was one filed in circuit court which was dismissed. Okay. So I don't know if three, I'm not, I don't believe there's others. Okay. So with regard to this bill, I mean, as you know, we, 
we basically vote by mail at this point. And so they're, they're what, what are the restrictions? You, you don't throw away the, the, how long do you have to keep the paper ballots that come in in the mail? So we have to keep it 22 months after the election. We're required to keep the records 22 months after the election. So basically in, almost until the next election. Right before the next election. Okay. Is there anything, if there was some, if, if there was some reason to believe that the, that the audits called for in this bill were not accurate for some reason that you couldn't go back? Is there, is there a reason that you couldn't go back and look at the, the actual paper ballots? No, there's no reason. And, and in fact, we said that when we do conduct these audits, if, if an observer or somebody wants to go actually look at the, the, the actual paper ballot, they, that we can go back and find that ballot and show that to them to show them that it is the correct replica. Okay. So having said all that, what, why do you want this bill? What's this bill accomplish for the Office of Elections? So we're required to confirm the election of, con confirm the results of the election through audits. Uh, this bill allows us to do an audit and conduct it uh, more efficiently because as you know, when we switched over to elections by mail, ballots come in as voters vote them, not by precincts as in the polling place model. So when we do process ballots, they're all mixed in together. It just depends on how voters voted. This allows us to efficiently uh, segregate using images, segregate the district precinct so we can conduct the entire audit on it. So what we do is we look for the image for that selected precinct, the randomly selected precinct, and we, we have actual humans or auditor key people actually hand tallying the replica image of the ballot. Okay, so there's still a requirement in this bill that you do the 10% 10, 10 of precincts be audited? Correct. Okay. Is there any data that says that, that hand counting is more accurate than a machine count or vice versa? As far as, as far as I know, hand counting has been shown to be less accurate because when you involve human element, you have human error, you have subjectivity. Uh, machines are objective. They're Studies I've seen shown have shown that machine counts are actually more accurate than okay. hand counts. Okay. Other questions, members? Oh yes. Senator Sangbani Sorry. Um, Scott. Yes. I, okay. I think the concern is because um, I think thank you because for answering Chair Rhodes' question regarding the ten percent because it looks like the bill still requires the ten percent of precincts. But I think the concern is that if we pass this bill, and I'm looking at page five, the audit may be conducted with scanned images or voter verifiable, verifiable paper audit trails, that basically you're always going to conduct the audit by the scanned images and never by the voter verifiable paper audit. What my, my question is going to be, how can a citizen require the other version of the audit be conducted if this gives you a pass to just do it by scanned images? So the, so the scanned images that we actually do uh, the audit with, are ex they're exact replicas of a ballot. They're just an electronic format. So it's, it's for all intents and purposes a PDF of the ballot. So it's not like we're, and we're doing it manually. So it's not like we're actually touching the ballot. So we're actually preserving the actual paper ballot or the evidence in case there was an issue. Because if we were to do it using the paper ballots, you would have a lot of hands touching them and the uh, chain of custody there could be questioned if something were to, if there were an issue with a ballot. So when we actually use the images, we're, we're not using, a, we're using an actual, digital replica of the ballot. It's a one-for-one -one copy, so. So you're not answering my question. How can a citizen require so to, to okay. do the so, verifiable if we pass this bill allowing you to just use canned images? Because as, I mean, even myself, okay? And okay. I'm for electronic voting. We've all had experiences where the electronic data screws us up and we always rely upon the paper ballot. So how can a citizen require you to do the verifiable paper audit if we pass this bill? So like I said, as official observers, when they're observing the process, 
if they see something, if they see a scan that does not look right to them, they can always flag us and ask us to actually pull up the actual paper ballot so we can go to the paper ballot to show them that what they see on the screen is what the paper ballot is. So does the bill allow for that, require you to do that if there is an appeal of your scanned image audit? Uh, I don't see how the bill would prevent that. that, that that's in our procedures. Um, and that's something we would just do because like we um, were the integrity of the election. We would do something like that. But the bill doesn't prevent that. Okay, thank you. I think, yeah, I don't think the bill just doesn't address it. So I think it's yeah, that, somewhere that's else. the problem. No, I think it's somewhere else in the stage already. So uh, Senator Elefante, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Chair Rhodes did ask a lot of my questions to you, um, Chief Elections Officer Nago. What, um, just from a process standpoint, how do you determine which particular contest to audit? So the, the, the precincts, the district precincts and the contests are random. The district precincts are randomly selected by official observers and the contests are um, selected by official observers. So we okay. don't select any of that. Okay. And then how, about up to how many contests would you select in a, in an audit? Like, for example, so, going back to the last election cycle. So we start with one precinct per, um, we start with one contest per precinct. Uh, it's an audit. So we're just confirming elections. If for instance, in the process of our audit, we find that there is something not correct. We would expand the audit, but we would start off with one contest per precinct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Other questions? Okay. Seeing none, let's go ahead and move on to the next bill. Thank you everyone for being here. Next up is HB 141. Beginning on January 1st, 2025, this requires each legislator to include with the legislator's disclosure of financial interest the names of certain lobbyists with whom the legislator has a certain kind of uh, business relationship. Uh, first up on 141. is uh, Robert Harris for the Ethics Commission. Good morning, Mayor, the Executive Director of the Ethics Commission. Good morning, Chair. Uh, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I realize in looking at what was submitted that you have the wrong testimony. It appears the wrong file was attached, and I apologize for that. We are in support of this measure. Uh, briefly, we see it as an opportunity to ensure that there is transparency over relationships between legislators and lobbyists or lobbying organizations. It is furthering our already existing laws, which is the intent is to make sure that these types of relationships can't be masked behind uh, essentially other corporations or entities standing behind the payment. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Um, next is Daniel Foley for Commission to Improve Standards of Conduct. Good morning, morning Judge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, the Commission to Improve Standards of Conduct uh, worked on this bill with Mr. Harris and the Ex Ethics Commission, and we support it for the reasons uh, Mr. Harris stated to increase transparency and uncover potential conflicts of interest or self-dealing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Next up is Mills Wong Judith for League of Women Voters. In support, Nancy Cook Lauer for All Hawaii News. Also in support, Lynn Madison in support, Andrew Crossland in support, Will Karen in support, Regina Peterson in support. That's everybody who signed up for HB 141. Does anyone else wish to testify in HB 141? Seeing on members' questions? Uh, yes. Yes, Senator Simplin and Troy. Um, for Harris. <coughs> So this basically requires that um, that our, our financial disclosure, which we are required to provide, basically requires us to name the various potential lobbyists. I'm trying to figure out how this works because um, a number of us declare our conflict of interest whenever a certain bill comes into play. Like for instance, I've declared my conflict of interest whenever a fire department bill comes into play. And I say my husband is a member of the firefighter. But how do we how do we declare it before the bill when we don't know whether or not there's gonna be a like a fire department bill coming up? Sure. So 
This would require, again, the financial disclosure statements are filed annually. This would require financial transactions. And again, re lobbyists are registered with us. There's approximately 370 registered lobbyists. Oh, so we look at this list of lobbyists right. and we just assume that one of those lobbyists will have a bill in front of us this coming session. So we declare that we have either a business partner, employer, so or if, that kind of relationship annually looking at this list. Right, so I'm just trying to figure out how we do it. Sure. So uh, plainly, I think one of the things that will be necessary is that we spend some time both doing guidance and, and trying to do education to make sure that the application of this is, is easy. So, I mean, to be fully transparent, that, that would be one of our biggest focuses to make sure people know how to do this. The relationships that would have to be disclosed are financial, to be clear. So you have to be paid by that lobbyist or lobbying organization. You have to be paid. You, you need to speak to the mind. Correct. You would need to be paid. So it's a financial. So for us, it would oh, be a okay. financial. So if you are receiving, say, for example, a pharmaceutical company is a lobbying organization and they're paying you or a company you work for over $5,000, that's the relationship that has to be disclosed. Me or my spouse, right? Or you, partner. You or a company that you own or your employer. So for example, if you worked for a consulting firm uh, as a secondary job and they are hiring your consulting firm, that the would same be- The same consulting firm. Correct. Okay, at, on the annual disclosure. Correct. And it wouldn't matter with regards to if they're gonna be testifying in front of you or not. It's just simply the fact it's a registered lobbying organization or a registered lobbyist. Okay, and the income has to be at least $5,000, so. Correct. Okay. Okay, so I guess the other thing is um, a number of us, I mean, are, or our spouses, because it also refers to members, partner, which includes spouse, or it doesn't. I'm just looking at page 11. Yeah, so I think we're using partner in the legal sense, like a partner of a corporation, partner, et cetera. But um, well, typically- it also says reciprocal beneficiary or spouse. Correct. So, so typically for us, financial disclosures do include your spouse as well as dependent children, correct? So I, I'm sorry, I, I'm back to, in the event that our spouse is a member of a nonprofit such as I'm just looking at like YMCA that just came by and YMCA lobbies us. Okay. And they don't get paid by being a member of that board. We don't need to disclose it. Um, if correct, if it's a financial, so if, if you're in this example, if your husband were to work for the YMCA. And gets 5,000 or more. Correct. As an employee, then that would be reported. If they were a but board, if it's like a board, board member, that would not. Effort, you don't need to. Correct. But you'd have to report it somewhere else, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Not, in, not in this bill. Yeah. Correct. Okay. I'm just trying to figure this out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have one more question for you, uh, Executive Director. So, on the, it looks like the only. Um, Paragraph four actually refers to the partner. So a client of the member, member's partner, or member's employer. But all the other ones, it's just um, it's just of the member. So it's just that one subsection or one paragraph that refers to partners. Is that correct? Apologize, I'm pulling it up right now. I'm sorry. It's page um, page eleven, line eleven. That is correct. Okay, so uh 
client of the member, member's partner, or member's employer, where the client provided at least 5,000 of income during the preceding calendar year. Okay, so that, okay, that's just, that's just clients then, I guess. But then, okay, so I guess the question is there. So say you, uh, say your spouse represented, um, I don't know, somebody big, Alexander and Baldwin. The, the the client itself would not be registered as a lobbyist. I don't believe it would be lobbyists hired by the company. So would this apply or does it only, it's only if the client is the actual lobbyist? So currently, if a spouse is directly paid by Alexander Baldwin, that would currently be reported. The challenge has been if the spouse, for example, works for a consulting firm and one of their clients is a lobbyist and that money is essentially going to the consulting firm and they're getting a salary from the consulting firm. What they report is the salary from the consulting firm. So we wouldn't necessarily see the relationship with the lobbyist. So the attempt of this bill generally, just speaking generally, and I'll get to okay. your specific- Directly to the lobby. It is essentially to show that, that connection. Um, okay. And so here, I think it is still being narrowly construed to look at the specific legislator. Um, and again, I think it's probably a valid discussion about whether or not we want to try to do that reach to spouses who have clients through it. Okay, yeah, no, that's, I mean, members, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we're fair game. I mean, you got to be able to tell people what your relation, if you have a business relationship with a lobbyist, but for spouses and a domestic partners, it seems a little iffier. Okay, thank you. Other questions, members? Okay, if not, let's go ahead and move on. Thank you for being here. Uh, HB 264, this makes intentionally or knowingly causing bodily injury to a sports official, a class C felony. First up on S HB 264 is Keith Hayashi for the Department of Education. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Members of the committee, I'm Raymond Fujino on behalf of the Superintendent Hayashi. Um, the department stands on its written testimony in support of this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Lauren uh, Hogan, Hogan, Deputy Attorney General. Oh, good morning. Good morning, Chair Burns, members of the committee. Uh, my name is uh, Lauren Hogan, Deputy Attorney General, representing uh, the Attorney General's Office. Thank you for having this bill, uh, House Bill 264. Um, I stand on my written testimony, but basically the testimony was merely to point out a typographical error that was presented, uh, I think, in 2020 when the bill was first introduced. State uh, would be asking to amend line seven on page one, uh, basically inserting subsection one between uh, 707, 711, and paragraph A. And it's merely for this. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Next up is Lee Hayakawa for the Office of Public Defender. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair uh, Rhodes, uh, Senator Alaconte, Senator San Benaventura. Uh, my name is James Tavis, State Public Defender, standing in for Mr. Hayakawa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we oppose this bill um, as a former player, though I know it doesn't look like one, former coach, former sports official, referee. I, and as a fan, I understand uh, sports officials have a very difficult job. Trust me, I, I do know. <laughs> Um, but, um, uh, and I, you know, they should not be subject to, uh, assault or, or even verbal abuse, but, uh, this bill, I think is like many other bills that come, um, from years past, it's taking a, a class of people and elevating it to assault two. Assault three, people that harm referees or sports officials are subject to one year in jail already. Mm -hmm. That should be a deterrent enough if deterrence is in the, um, I guess, the perpetrator's mindset. But as, as our written testimony indicates, it hardly is. But I, I, again, I have the utmost respect for sports officials, but I do think that uh, it's not necessary to increase this to a felony. I am available for any questions. Great, thank here. you. Next is Shannon Matson in support. And that's everyone we have who's signed up on HB 264. Does anyone else wish to testify? Come on up. 
What are you doing? Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, and the Judiciary Committee. My name is Angela Melody Young. I'm testifying on behalf of CARES in strong support. Um, so our society, our culture, um, and social media content um, condones domestic violence and abuse, yet by law and through ethics, we know abuse is never okay. Um, this chapter is very comprehensive and includes a list of people um, such as educators, emergency medical personnel, nurses, doctors, um, and kapunas who may be vulnerable to harm and abuse. Um, the amendment adds sporting officials to the list, and there should be consideration to also add legislators to the list. Um, and we're going to provide comments about um, this. What constitutes an, as an offense in this measure is when harm has already happened intentionally or knowingly causing bodily injury. And there should be consideration that if someone feels threatened by verbal abuse, that should constitute as an offense. Verbal abuse to sporting officials um, verbal abuse to kapunas, educators, anyone from the list should constitute as an offense. Um, this addresses abuse before it happens. It also empowers the victim to report an incident and it sends a message that abuse at any level is not okay. So the central component of this law is to protect a person while he or she is performing his or her duties and to protect the vulnerable demographics. Protection should start before injury occurs injury occurs. Often before the injury happens, emotional, mental, and verbal abuse will occur. At this point is when the law should be put into effect, um, not after the victim has already been abused. Um, the law operates from a deterrence theory that if a crime has bad punishment, then people aren't likely to offend. If it is legislated to say when severe injury occurs, it is a felony, then people won't offend. That's a deterrence theory. Um, now I'm going to read from a publication from um, uh, the, a deterrence theory from the Minnesota House Research, and um, it states that. Okay, the, thank oh, you very much. Okay. Uh, anybody else wish to testify on HB 264? 264. If not, members in questions? Uh, yes. Senator San Buen uh, Public defender, come on up. So, so. I sort of agree with you that every session, it seems like we are protecting a special class of people. Is there, um, but I also remember that we have like an extended or enhanced punishment section that protects these certain classes. So what I'm trying to figure out is, do we already have a statute that would protect individuals in these vulnerable classes already, such as, you know, like Kapuna. I mean, I think a couple of years ago, we said 60 and above, all of what gets enhanced penalties. And um, then we included like healthcare professionals to be part of that because they get assaulted over in the ERs. And I think utility workers started becoming part of this, or dispatchers right. was another one. So but I'm trying to figure out if, if, if there's already an enhanced, because I'm asking you because I don't see a prosecutor here. But I see AG, but. Right. Um, so there are all the examples you said, there are various I'm ways. I'm sorry, Mr. Toby, can you just pull the oh, mic closer to your face? Thank you. Thank you. There, various, I guess, ways of addressing those. The age issue, 60 years old, protected class, that is, there's a special enhancement statute that applies, I guess, across the board on, on many offenses. Healthcare workers, bus drivers, um, dispatchers, uh, emergency workers, those are, receive extra protection, similar to the way the sports official bill is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is seeking. A, a statute, I guess a bill was pa uh, was passed to elevate uh, assaulting those special classes to a class C felony, class <clears throat> second degree. So th that's how most of them are done. Uh, just to, as for dispatchers, apparently that was elevated because it wasn't really so much that they needed the extra protection, but I think it had to do with something with benefits last year and, and, and whatnot, or, you know, some kind of a Workers club. Yeah, whatever. I, I, whatever it was, but I don't know what it was. I mean, yeah, you know, I understand it, but somehow it got tied into assault two uh, language. So 
So the most part, most of the special classes are done piecemeal every year, or every couple of years. And we, uh, we, just, we just add the growing list to assault too. So I'm trying to figure out whether or not it would be cleaner to put in, uh, because we do want to protect, because they're usually volunteers, right? Yes, I was. Yeah, yeah, they're usually volunteers and we don't want them to be assaulted, especially right. when they're just volunteering. Right. Whether or not we could, we should just add them in as part of this already enhanced punishment special class instead of instead of creating a special felony for them. Yeah, but I think the ones like the age sixty and above, I think it's certain felonies, and I think it so you know or mandatory minimums or whatnot that add. So if we make it a misdemeanor, I don't know how you're going to change that to, because it's a misdemeanor right now. It's a, you know, one year jail. So I don't know how the statute's going to need some work. Yeah. Okay. In, in, on that issue. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions, members? If not, I'm going to call a short recess, uh, just a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Recess. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I got a recess for our 930 agenda here at the Judiciary Committee. We'll move on to the next bill, which is HB 349 relating to children expands the original jurisdiction of family court to include proceedings for declaration of emancipation of minors. First up on 349 is uh, Behavior Health Administration. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, Chair Rose and the member. My name is Kaylee Aquaro. I'm the acting administrator for the Child and Adolescent. Just Mental pull the mic closer oh, so people sure. behind you can hear you. <laughs> I'm Kaylee Aquaro. I'm the acting administrator for the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Division. I stand on our written testimony. We support the intent of the bill. We support a pathway for youth to be emancipated when appropriate. But we did offer a comment that uh, emancipation determinations are outside of the scope of expertise of the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Division. I thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am available for questions. Great, thank you. Thank Next you. up is Judge Viola for the uh, Viola for the Judiciary. Uh, with comments. Next is Michael Galoyo Jr. for Stonewall Caucus of Democratic Party of Hawaii. Good morning. Good morning, um, Michael Galoyo, Chair of the Stonewall Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. We stand in strong support um, as it currently stands. The only way for a minor to become emancipated in the state of Hawaii is if they're rich. Um, and that doesn't seem fair, especially since this is one of the avenues uh, minor that's in a uh, less than ideal, uh, in a abusive home life can find a way to uh, extricate themselves from that. So we encourage you to pass this bill to help protect those that definitely need this protection. Mahalo. Thank you. Next up is Mike Goyu Sr. Uh, for Rainbow Family 808 in support. Judith Clark, Hawaii Youth Services Network, also in support. Carla Hauser for Residential Youth Services and Empowerment in support. Will Karen in support, Dara Carlin with comments. That's everybody who signed up on HB 349. Would anyone else like to test? Yeah, please come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sydney Story. I am a student at the William S. Richardson School of Law and also an inter a policy intern with the Opportunity Youth Action Hawaii. Um, in addition to what you heard earlier, we are a collaboration of individuals that seek to reduce and eliminate youth incarceration. Um, sorry, organizations, individuals that seek to eliminate youth incarceration, but also to improve the continuity of programs and services for youth and young adults transitioning from minor to adult status. And we supported written testimony, but I just wanted to emphasize a couple of points. Um, here in Hawaii, we have seen an increase in child abuse and neglect in recent years that is higher than the national average. I mean, we have a number of unaccompanied minors in shelter housing who live independently from their parents and make their own decisions about their education, their employment, their health needs. 
And without the option of emancipation, these individuals are stuck in stasis in these temporary sh shelter situations until they turn 18. Um, so providing youth with a judicial avenue to emancipation at the age of 16 would give them the ability to sign leases, contracts, other legal documents without parental consent. They'd be able to work full time, manage their own finances, make decisions about um, enrolling in college or vocational programs without the need for parental consent. So for these children who have been living independently, emancipation offers a legal avenue by which they're able to begin exercising responsibility, safety, and freedom over their lives. So we urge you to pass this bill. Thank you, Reed. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to testify on HB 349? Seeing none, members questions on HB 349. Seeing none, let's go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is HB 386. This prohibits in certain circumstances the publication of the personal information of federal and state judges and other judicial staff. Uh, first up on 386 is uh, Thomas Berger for the Judiciary. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Chair Rhodes and members of the committee. Thomas Berger, I'm a staff attorney at the Hawaii Supreme Court appearing for the Judiciary. The Judiciary supports House Bill 386. Uh, you know, recently there, there was an incident at a judge's home where a, a party in a case did show up to the home. And this bill is intended to address the most egregious situations where um, parties are encouraging people to go to judges homes to perform a violent act. And what we've seen on the mainland is, you know, the, the worst case situation where um, a, a judge's family member was actually killed at the home. So, um, you know, we do understand that the Ways and Means Committee did express an interest in a measure that would provide the same protections in this bill to other public officials. And, and we agree that the same rationale underlying this measure, it, it should apply to other public officials and, and we would support uh, you know, we do understand that the title of the bill would, would um, make it difficult for this session, but we do uh, hope that the committee does move this bill forward and I'm available for any questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Robert Cavaco testifying for show, uh, State of Hawaii Organization of Police Officers in support. Uh, H, uh, Hawaii State Bar Association, Rhonda Griswold, president, um, also in support. That's all the, everyone who signed up for HB 386, does anyone else wish to testify in HB 386? Yep, come on up. Good morning again. Um, Angela Melody Young testifying on behalf of CARES in strong support. Um, so protecting legislators um, is something um, of importance and um, especially with what we saw last week with um, some of the um, things that were going out going on outside um, with their um, with the tents. Um, I'm not going to go into it too publicly, but um, yeah, so safeguarding parameters um, to protect legislators is a must. Um, we can see legislators um, are vulnerable to riots and according to chapter, 711-1103, um, a person who commits the offense or riot if the person participates with five or more other persons in a course of a disorderly conduct, uh, disorderly conduct is a classy felony. Um, and um, so because legislators are vulnerable to such activities, um, and um, public disturbances involving um, violence and threats, um, it should be constituted into the parameters to protect legislators. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify in HB 386? Seeing none, members questions? Okay, seeing none. All right, uh, we're running up against our uh, deadline here. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to do one more bill, which is HB 463, and then we'll vote on those. But so if, um, I apologize if you're here for HB 586, 724, or 980. We're gonna roll those over until Friday. Uh, what, what other stuff do we have going on Friday? Friday will be the last bill. We could do it at the time today to have this created. Okay, so we'll roll, we'll roll the last three bills to 10.30 on Friday in this room. Uh, what day is that? The 17th? 17th, so we'll see. What, for those, we'll uh, repair to St. Patrick's Day. Okay, so let's try to do this one more bill. HB 463. Uh, HB 463 lowers the threshold for disclosure of campaign expenditures for non-candidate committees to $100. 
First up on this is uh, Campaign Spending Commission. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Rhodes, members of the committee, Tony Valdemero testifying on behalf of the Campaign Spending Commission. Uh, the commission has submitted written testimony and will stand on that written testimony providing comments on this bill. If you have any questions, I'll be free to answer them. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next is Lynn Manasal in support, Andrew Crossland in support. That's everyone who signed up on HB 463. Does anyone want to testify? Anyone else want to testify on HB 463? Seeing none, members, questions? Okay, seeing none. Um, We'll go ahead and stop for decision making. And as I mentioned before, we'll roll the other three over until, I already forgot the time, 10.30? 10.30 on Friday, okay. Um, members, are you okay to just go straight to decision making? Um, I just, I want to know what you're gonna do with 349. What is 349? Because Department of Health wants... Um, yeah, I was gonna take their... Yeah, they, they all they said that they don't have the expertise. So my suggestion is to sub sub in Department of Human Services because they're yeah, the ones. I was going to. Okay, good. Okay. All right, back to the top of the agenda. Uh, HB 68, this appropriates funds to establish a centralized statewide criminal pretrial justice data reporting and collection system. Our recommendation here was to pass with some amendments. Uh, we'd like to require semi annual progress reports for two years from the Criminal Justice Research Institute slash judiciary and judiciary about creation and with the judiciary about creation of the data reporting and collection system. Uh, we'll add language that ongoing staff support for the data system will be done by the Institute staff and not contracted out. That's the ongoing staff support, not the actual uh, initial setup contract. Um, and we'll put in protections for the, the information and data that's being shared. So the practice is to, to secure it, but we will um, uh, we will put that in the statute. And finally, we will note the funding amounts um, requested by the Criminal Justice Research Institute in the committee report. Questions or concerns? If not, Acting Vice Chair Elefante. It, Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 68, HB 1 with amendments. Uh, Chair Rhodes. Aye. Vice Chair is excused. Uh, I vote aye. Senator San Buenaventura. Aye. Senator Awa. Aye. Mr. Chair, recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next up is HB 126. This increases the penalties for bribery offenses under certain circumstances. Recommendation here is to pass with some amendments and make it look more like the, the one of the earlier um, bribery bills we passed out. So. We'll accept the AG's recommendation to delete notwithstanding any law to the contrary at page two, line 19. We'll add a preamble. We will keep the charge at a class B felony and we'll add mandatory fine language for up to $250,000. And we'll apply it equally to all public officials, not just the heightened penalty in this bill for the specific um, ones that are mentioned. And we'll amend the salary commission statute to consider avoidance of corruption as a factor in recommendations and we'll leave the date bad. So there will be something to talk about in conference. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yes, I'm sorry. There was a second amendment from the uh, from the attorney general to say a person charged with is not eligible for a dank or a tag instead of convicted. Makes good sense. Any questions or concerns? If not, Senator Elefante. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 126, HD 1 with amendments of the four members present. Are there any no votes? Any votes with reservations? Hearing none, Mr. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next up is HB 132, establish the definitions for purposes of electronic voting, specifies additional requirements and procedures with which the Chief Elections Officer must comply. Um, I, my recommendation is to pass as is. The, the objections raised, I don't believe, are valid and um, there are a number as as testified to by the chief elections officers there are a number of fail safes there is still because we do vote by mail we have we always can drop fall back to the the paper ballots that come in by mail and that's sort of the uh, I mean that's that's the operative document so a uh, recommendation is to pass as is questions or concerns Yes, concern when I looked at the number here of opposition to support 111 to 1. Is this correct? Yep, that's correct. It's okay. yeah. 
Other concerns or questions? If not, Senator Alafonte. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 132 HD 1 as is of the four members present. Are there any no votes? No vote. Okay. Noting the no vote from Senator San Buenaventura and Senator Awa, uh, Senator Alafonte will vote with reservations. Uh, Mr. Chair. Motion fails. Motion fails. Yeah. On a tie. Okay, moving on to HB 141. Uh, relating to financial disclosures beginning January 1st, 2025 requires each state legislator include within this legislator's disclosure of financial interest the names of certainly lobbyists with whom the legislator has a relationship. Um, so the, the section on the, um, there's only one part of it that applies to the member's spouse or um, domestic partner and that so with that one, we want to make it clear that the that the client has to be on the lobbyist list. It's not that the client is a company that has lobbyists. It's an actual lobbyist is the client. So that would be the amendment. Questions or concerns? If not, Senator Elefante. Okay, Chair's recommendation uh, with amendments, yes? Yes. Uh, uh, is to pass HB 141, HD 1 with amendments of the four members present. Are there any no votes? Any votes with reservations? Hearing none, Mr. Chair, recommendations adopted. Okay, thank you. Next up is HB 264 relating to crimes against sports officials. Uh, recommendation here is to pass uh, with the, the AG's technical amendments. Questions or concerns? If not, Senator Alafonte. Okay, Chair's recommendations to pass HB 264 with amendments of the four members present. Are there any no votes? Any votes with reservations? No vote. No vote for Senator Awa. Mr. Chair, recommendations adopted. Thank you. Next up is HB 349. This expands the original jurisdiction of family court to include proceedings for declaration of emancipation of minors. Uh, the recommendation on 349 is to pass with an amendment, with some amendments. We accept Department of Human Services Child Welfare, I'm sorry, we accept DOH's amendment to give the psychological evaluations prior to emancipation to the Child Welfare Services uh, part of the of, uh, Department of Human Services. Her Judge Viola's will make it, Judge Viola's request will make it effective September 1, 2023. And then there was also a request to add in some verbiage on page 11, line three to five, and in absence of undue influence or coercion by any third party. So that section will now read, the minor resides separately and apart from the minor's parents or guardian at the minor's own will, with or without the parent or guardian's consent, and in absence of undue influence or coercion by any third party. And then also on line 11, page 18 and 19, we'll add, or by any other third party. So that part will read, the minor is not seeking emancipation under duress, including by coercion of a parent, guardian, or by any other third party. That's the recommendation. Questions or concerns? If not, Senator Alfonte. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 349 HD 2 with amendments of the four members present. Are there any no votes? No vote. No need a no vote from Senator Awa. Any votes with reservations? Hearing none, Mr. Chair, recommendations adopted. Okay, thank you. Next up is HB 386 prohibits in certain circumstances the publication of the personal information of federal and state judges and other judiciary staff. Uh, recommendation here is to pass as is. Questions or concerns? If not, Senator Alfonte. Okay, Chair's recommendation is to pass HB 386, HD 1, as is, of the four members present. Any no votes? Any votes with reservations? Hearing none, Mr. Chair, recommendations adopted. Okay, thanks. Next up is HB 463. This lowers the threshold for disclosure of camp campaign expenditures for non-candidate committees to $100. Recommendation is to pass on with a, uh, with a, a delayed effective date, March 22, 2075. CSC would like to get an AG's opinion, so we'll give them some time to get that and see how we go from there. So with an amendment, but just a bad date. Questions or concerns? If not, Senator Alfonte. Okay, Chair's recommendations to pass HB 463 with amendments of the four members present. Any no votes or votes with reservations? Hearing none, Mr. Chair, recommendations adopted. Okay, thank you. That's as far as we got. So the last three bills we'll pick up on Friday. We're adjourned.